Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, thank you to Jeff and Anita for inviting me to speak today. It's quite the honor. And I, and I have to uh, devilish, devilishly admit that I actually had a lot of fun getting this presentation together. And uh, I'm going to start off by um, telling a story from my first year as a faculty member. And uh, we have this thing that we affectionately call tenure camp at St. Michael's, which is essentially where we indoctrinate the new faculty members. So the junior faculty come in and they're indoctrinated by the senior faculty members. And when I was in tenure camp, a philosopher said to me, you know, philosophy is really about polishing the pyramid. Everything that's been discovered has already been discovered. Everything that's written has already been written. And all modern philosophers do is polish the pyramid. And I left thinking, is that really right? And I spent a lot of time thinking about how I view science. And that's not how I view science at all. And so I came up with this analogy, which I shared with my, my tenure camp fellows next week, which is that science is really more like wandering the desert. And you, all you see is sand everywhere. And you step on something, and you make that initial observation, because you pricked your toe, and you come up with a hypothesis. And you start moving the sand around it. And you're like, we think we found a pyramid. And so you call your friends over, you start to build a field, as you guys did, and you clear more and more people, or you clear more and more sand, and you realize it's not a pyramid, it's actually an obelisk. And then you have a community of scientists that are clearing the sand, and they have bulldozers, and you start to reveal the beauty of the field, and you realize it's not an obelisk, it's an arts and craft bungalow. So, so that's the story that I'm going to tell today about how Fred Nader and Jeff Becker created two arts and crafts bungalows, which I'm going to call the PTR and the OPT gene families. By the way, the philosopher didn't like it when I shared that the following week. So, so, um, so let me start off by defining peptide transport as we define it today. So peptide transport is very simply the translocation of peptides across the plasma membrane in an energy-dependent manner and is protein-mediated. Um, but I'm going to go back to 1972 when Fred and Jeff were in Israel and they were um, asking questions about peptide transport. And the first question was, can yeast even transport peptides? And uh, for those of you who know anything about yeast, you know that their native environment out there in the wilds is on rotting fruit. So there was reason to think that they actually might be able to transport peptides. As a, as a fruit is rotting, it's, uh, proteolysis is occurring, and so you have free amino acids being produced in peptides. So you might um, hypothesize, as they did, that uh, since they're in the environment, perhaps yeast can feed on them. Now, as everyone in this room knows, the first problem a scientist faces is you have to come up with a way to measure your phenomenon, whatever that is. And so Fred and Jeff, had to come up with a way to measure peptide transport. So Fred serendipitously happens to be a peptide chemist, and Jeff was a yeast biologist. And Jeff, as he said earlier, had just recently um, isolated a, a methionine oxytroph, meaning that if you don't give these cells methionine, they can't grow. Uh, Fred was able to synthesize peptides with methionine, and they came up with a very simple growth assay. So it's a positive selection. And all you do is you take a medium with a methionine-containing peptide, you streak some yeast cells on it, you watch, and if they grow, you add peptide transport. You could also do this in liquid culture um, by taking a, a liquid that in contain, a growth medium that contained a peptide, inoculate it with yeast, and if the turbidity increases, peptide transport occurred. So now this is what this actually looks like um, in the lab. So this is a growth medium right here. So this is our methionine oxytroph. If we give it methionine, notice they grow. If we don't give them methionine, they don't grow. And in this case, the peptide was not taken up because they didn't grow. And this is a figure that Jeff showed earlier, um, showing increase of turbidity over time in clet units. And here we have time. So if you get a flat line, there's no peptide transport. And if you have um, an increase in turbidity, you have peptide transport. OK, so the first tool that, that these two gentlemen um, created for, for really initiating a field uh, was the ability to measure peptide transport through growth. They very cleverly came up with a second mechanism. This happens to be my personal favorite. And this is a negative screen. So this is measuring resistance to toxic peptides. And the assay works something like this. So you take a Petri dish, and you put a lot of cells on it. And onto that dish, you're going to spot uh, a disk which has a toxic peptide. Now, the toxic peptide is going to diffuse out into the growth me medium as these uh, uh, cells are growing. And if they take up the toxic peptide, they'll die. And uh, so you get a zone of growth inhibition. So it's a negative screen because if you transport peptides, you die. And then the former one is a positive screen because if you transport peptides, you live. Okay, and then 
not, not satisfied, they came up with a third way to actually measure peptide transport, and this is through radio labeling peptides. And this really was critical because this got them into the field of biochemistry and into kinetics. So they were able to measure uptake over time. They were, to do it at, they were able to do it at different concentrations, and of course then plot it in line weaver burke and get KM and Vmax uh, for these peptide transporters. So if you think about what you need to do to create a brand new model system that's never been investigated, the first thing you have to do is create tools that enable you to answer your questions. And so they created these, these tools and then went into the physiology in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And so this is a, a table out of one of their papers. Everything in this column were peptides that were substrates for Saccharomyces, so the cells could grow on them. Everything in this column were not substrates. And through a series of iterative experiments, they were able to show, first of all, that there are size limitations, so that yeast can't transport any peptides, only two to three amino acids, um, that there's stereospecificity that it prefers, or yeast prefer, L amino acids over D, that it's uh, proton-coupled uh, symport, I think the stoichiometry is one-to-one, -one, and that amino acid composition matters. They won't transport just any peptide. What's in the peptide matters. And they made one other really astute observation that I think took everyone by surprise. So this is that um, toxicity assay again. And what they're doing is they're measuring toxicity to, uh, measuring sensitivity to a toxic dipeptide. And in the growth medium here, we have three different to toxic peptides that have been spotted. And notice that this yeast strain is not sensitive to two out of the three. You take this exact same growth condition, and now you add 100 micromolar leucine, and you get really gangbuster sensitivity. So for reasons that, were, that weren't intuitive, amino acids induce the uptake of peptide transport. All right, so as Jeff alluded to earlier, in the 1980s and 90s, um, Fred and Jeff decided they would enter into the molecular world and try to clone the genes that were responsible for dye and tripeptide transport in Saccharomyces. And for those of you that are molecular biologists, you know what people like me do is we break things and then ask, you know, what, what do we break and how does it work? And so the first step is to isolate uh, mutants. So a graduate student screened a population of yeast cells that have been mutagenized for the resistance to a toxic dipeptide and found three categories of mutants, which were named PTR1, PTR2, and PTR3 for peptide transport. And this is a figure from that paper. So right here, um, this is the wild-type yeast taking up a radio-labeled dipeptide over a three-minute time course. So that's what yeast should be doing. Here's the PTR1 and PTR2 mutants showing that they can't transport peptides at all, and the PTR3 mutant had uh, an intermediate phenotype. Now, in the 90s, uh, a series of graduate students, starting with Jack Perry, cloned first PTR2, quickly followed by PTR1 by Kumar Lagraman, and then PTR3 by David Braun. And out of these three papers came a very elegant model that Fred and Jeff proposed. And here it is. Okay, so here we have uh, a yeast cell, or at least my rendition of a, of a yeast cell, in a, in a growth condition with peptides and amino acids. This protein is actually identified by Jerry Fink's lab. But when amino acids are present in the environment, they signal to SSY1, which activates PTR3. PTR3's role is to activate PTR1. Now, PTR1 is part of the ubiquitin proteolytic degradation system. And this is the system that's responsible for turning over and degrading proteins in a timely way in the cell. And PTR1's job is to determine which substrates are turned over. So PTR1 is like the targeting device for degrading certain proteins. One of its targets is a protein called CUP9. CUP9 is a repressor of PTR2. So this is a classic example of the way to turn on PTR2 is to turn off the off switch. Okay, so you turn off the off switch, PTR2 gets transcribed and translated, and you make it into the, to the to actual membrane transporter, and you can take in the peptides. A very, very elegant model, so kudos. All right, um, one of the things I learned from Fred and Jeff is that you can do anything you want in science as long as you can pay for it. <laughs> and, uh, and the key to being able to pay for your science is showing the relevance of your work. And so very early on, they, just, they had this idea that the relevance of peptide transport is really gonna be in drug delivery. And so this idea of illicit transport, which, which was alluded to earlier, was, was born. And then the first step of illicit transport is you have to characterize the peptide transporters in pathogenic fungi. And the pathogenic fungi of choice um, in the lab was Canada albicans, which is an opportunistic um, fungal pathogen. And so this is a, a, a table very similar to the one that I showed you earlier. These are various peptides. And this is their, um, this Canada albicans ability to grow on it. 
And what I want you to notice is, first of all, Canada albicans can grow and die in tripeptides, just like Saccharomyces can. But unlike Saccharomyces, it can also grow on oligopeptides. And so what this suggested is that this pathogenic fungus has at least two different transport systems, one for small peptides of two and three amino acids, and one for oligopeptides, which is much larger. All right. So since um, the genes had been cloned in Saccharomyces, the time was really ripe for trying to clone these genes out of pathogenic fungi. So this is actually when I joined the lab in the 1990s. And the, the strategy was through heterologous expression. And this is where you take a Saccharomyces or Baker's yeast strain. This one happened to be a lysine and leucine oxytroph and a PTR2 mutant. And you transform it with a library from your favorite organism. In this case, my favorite organism was Canada albicans. And what you're going to do is you're going to plate this yeast or these transformers out onto a growth medium that has the dipeptide lysine and leucine. So because this cell can't make its own lysine and leucine, the only way it will grow is if it internalizes this peptide and gets access to these amino acids. So you put this population down onto this growth medium. If you get lucky, and we did, you get some colonies, and those are your genes of interest. Okay, so this is what um, data from, from that paper would actually look like. So this is a wild-type yeast strain showing that it can actually take up a radio-labeled peptide over a four-minute time course. Here's the mutant um, that's lacking an endogenous peptide transporter. And when the peptide transport gene from Canada albicans, which was named CAPTR1, is put into the gene, into this organism, you know, it can notice you, it can transport peptides um, also. Now, after, after cloning a, uh, the first peptide transporter from a fungal pathogen, uh, Fred and Jeff decided to move into the plant world, and they cloned a series of peptide transporters from Arabid Arabidopsis thaliana. And this led to their naming and discovery of the first gene family that transports peptides in eukaryotes, which they named the PTR family. And this paper was published in 1995. Okay, remember a couple minutes ago I said that Canada albicans can transport small peptides of two and three amino acids, and it, it can also transport oligopeptides. So the second project was to try to use the same strategy of heterologous expression to clone um, the OPTs or the oligopeptide transporters out of Canada albicans. It was the same strategy, lysine and leucine oxytroph, PTR2 mutant. The library is once again a Canada albicans library. This time the selection is with a tetrapeptide, so an oligopeptide that has lysine and leucine. If you get colonies, and we did, um, you you've cloned your gene. And so once again, this is what, what, what a figure from that paper would look like. So down here, we're, we're measuring the uptake of a radio-labeled tetrapeptide over 13 minutes, looks like. Notice that the Saccharomyces cannot transport the substrate. You put the OPT gene, the oligopeptide transporter from Canada albicans in it, and it does. Using the same strategy, we very quickly showed that um, this gene is also found in other fungi, Schizosaccharomyces pombi, as well as Saccharomyces cerevisiae, much to our surprise, and it's also found in Arabidopsis. And so this led to the discovery of Fred and Jeff's second gene family, or their second bungalow, Arts and Crafts bungalow, which was named the OPT family for oligopeptide transporters. Now, this is actually when I graduated and left um, the Becker lab, and from there I went to Mike Freeling's lab at UC Berkeley where I studied plant development. And I'd always wanted to work at a small liberal arts college working with undergraduate students. And when, um, when I left Mike's lab, I was in a very crowded field, and so I spent some time thinking about what's an area that has some room still um, that, that could tap my expertise. And it turned out that no one was working on oligopeptide transporters. No one's working on OPTs in monocots. And so I contacted uh, Fred and Jeff with this idea, and I was a brand new faculty member, and I will forever be in your debt um, for agreeing to be on my, on my first NSF grant. And I'm convinced that the only reason it was funded is because the two of you were on it. So thank you for that. So, so we had this really um, crazy idea which is, actually it was a great idea, it wasn't a crazy idea, it was a great idea. So we had this idea that if you look at a, at a, uh, at a monocot seed, so here's a rice, a rice seed, it has really two, two, two domains. Um, you have the embryo and then you have what's called the endosperm. The endosperm is actually dead at maturity and is filled with starch and storage proteins. Um, when the embryo breaks dormancy, it hydrolyzes the proteins into amino acids and peptides and the starch into glucose. Now, because this is a dead space, that means that there are membranes that have to be crossed to, get, to gain access to this glucose, these peptides, and the amino acids in order for the seedling to grow. So what we hypothesized is that this region right here, what's called the scutellum, is filled with peptide transporters and specifically with OPTs. 
So as a first step, we ask the question, well, are there even OPTs expressed in germinating rice seeds? And the answer is yes. There's four of them that are expressed. And so we very quickly set about trying to clone these four genes, and we did. We put them into yeast expression vectors. We put them into yeast, and we asked the magical question, can they grow on peptides? And the answer is no. And so, so this is a figure showing um, two of these OPTs, OPT1 and OPT4, leucine. We added leucine so they can grow. They're missing leucine, they can't grow. We give them a peptide that's found in the rice endosperm, and they cannot grow. So Fred was very generous and synthesized just about every peptide I could imagine that's found in the rice endosperm, and no matter what we used, they would not grow. Um, Jeff's lab actually went in and did cytotoxic mutagenesis and codon optimized every one of these rice genes for Saccharomyces, and they did not grow. We took all the genes, moved them into Picia to try a different system, and they did not grow. So at some point, you have to, you just have to accept the fact that these genes are not doing what we thought they were doing. So I spent a little time, actually, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and. I had a realization one night, and that is that if you draw a phylogenetic tree of the OPT family in plants, there's two distinct clades, okay? What, one that's called the YS clade and one that's called the PT clade. And the genes that we were looking at are down here in the PT clade, and our, their closest orthologs are the ones that are Saccharomyces and Candida albicans. The genes that are up here had already been characterized in plants, and their role is to transport iron chelates where the chelates are actually made from 3S-adenosylmethionines. And so it's nicotiamine and um, eugenic acids for those of you who are familiar with them. So they're peptide-like in the sense that they're still made from uh, amino acids. And so, so we had this idea that perhaps the, the transporters down here in plants are also moving metal chelates. So we tested that hypothesis um, using a yeast strain that lacked endogenous iron transporters. So this is a strain that can't um, transport its own iron. We have empty vector and various rice OPTs here. Um, if we give this strain of yeast um, just iron on its own, it can't grow, showing that it can't transport it. It can't grow if we, uh, if we just have the empty vector. But as soon as you start to put OPTs in and you put into the growth medium iron that's coupled with nicotiamine, they start to grow. And so this paper was published in 2008, and since then, many, many labs have shown that the role of OPTs in plants seem to be moving um, uh, iron, cadmium, lead, and zinc um, um, up the soil and into the, uh, into the leaves. So I started off by talking about the two arts and crafts bungalows that these two men discovered in the, in the desert, and uh, one which we're calling the PTR family and one that we're calling the OPT family. And so what I want to do now is I want to fast forward to 2015 and describe what those two bungalows look like today, um, given that the work that I'm going to show now was, was created, was literally, um, was discovered by the community that you two dis, uh, created over, over the last 40 years. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to end with some, some words on, on you, Fred, if I may. So today, just in plants for the PTR family, there are more than 1,700 PTR genes that have been identified. It's an enormous number. And the, the really great news is that I think more than 1,600 of them have yet to be characterized. There's a lot of really exciting work to be done, and there will certainly be some surprises along the way. And interestingly enough, in plants, it seems like most of them are not peptide transporters, but nitrate, nitrite, uh, toxic secondary metabolites, um, and even hormone transporters. So this field is still wide open, I think. The OPTs are even less characterized than the PTRs. Um, the only thing that seems to be clear is that they transport metals, uh, that they are expressed in the roots and are involved as a secondary um, a system for scavenging metals from the roots. They move metals from the endosperm into the embryo, and then they're involved in moving metals um, throughout the, the vascular tissue of the plant. It's not going to let me go very far, is it? So there's not very many times in your life um, when you get to stand before one of your mentors and actually thank him in person in front of his peers for what he has done for you as a scientist and as a person. So I, I would like to, I'm going to, I have three sort of areas in which I'd like to speak for what you've done for me personally. And the first is uh, what Fred Nader did for me as the scientist. And very, Somewhere along the way, you taught me that it's not enough to love discovery. You really have to learn, love the process of discovery. And it's a very, it's a, it's a subtle difference, but discovery actually is easy to love because discovery is success, right? You know, I mean, success, it, it's, what you, it's what you have at the end of the day. Well, actually, at the end of a very rare day, you have discovery. Most days, you don't have discovery, right? So, 
What you have to learn to love is the process, and the process is about rigor, tenacity, and here's my favorite word, and grit. And Fred Nader, you have grit. So thank you for that. So uh, I'm convinced from watching the collaboration that you two have had over the last 45 years, um, it's, 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 it is the role model for collaborations. And, um, and I've tried to model so much of my career based upon collaborations for the following reason, that I'm convinced that the science is so much better when you have different people at the table that have multiple perspectives and can lend a different voice to the argument. And um, as close as we can ever get to the truth, you get much closer to it when you have different perspectives. And, and so thank you for that also. And actually, I'm going to go totally off script now, and I have to tell you a story. So I, I don't know how many years ago this was, but we were having a conversation about how there is a tension on all campuses between the sciences, the, um, the social sciences, and the humanities. And you made a comment which stuck with me, actually. And uh, it, essentially, you said that this, this tension is both natural and healthy if you allow it to be healthy. And I work at a liberal arts college, which is truly dominated by the humanities. And I've, I've most certainly had those days when I've been very frustrated as a scientist on a campus that's dominated by the humanities. And I've often gone back to that and said, how can I leverage this and look at this as something healthy and constructive for the college so that we all come out ahead? And, and, I, and as a result, they now call me, and I think affectionately, the universal collaborator on our campus. And I'm, I'm even writing my second book with someone in the humanities right now, and it's called Read Like a Scientist and under, uh, discovering great uh, science and literature. And then the mentor. Um, since, I, since I only work with undergraduates, I've spent quite a bit of time um, thinking about how to mentor someone that I only interact with for a very short period, usually you know, a year and a half to maybe two years. And uh, what I learned, I learned, I learned from the two of you, which is that you really have to treat the person as the individual that they are. You have to work with their strengths and address their weaknesses. You have to uh, respect and help them get to wherever, whatever their goals are, even if they weren't the same as yours. And so I'd, I'd like to, on behalf of everyone that's ever worked on the Peptide Transport Project, say thank you for great mentorship. Thank you, Mark. Well, now you know why Freddie succeeded, because he had great students like this, and uh, this is what it's all about in the academic world, having wonderful students, wonderful colleagues. Now the next student, Guy Caldwell, I know is going to do as well. Oh, we have questions. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, we have questions. Fred has a question. Uh-oh. And a stumper. So uh, first of all, I'm, I'm left speechless. That was just a wonderful talk. I, I guess one of the questions is, when you look at the PTR or the OPT family and you know that one of the things this family does is it transports peptides, you ask yourself, how does, how does the same type of gene code for a protein which has tremendous homology and transport metals? So if, if you look at, so they're all metal chelates, although there, there are some people that are arguing, um, and, they, and they have some, some convincing evidence that, that a couple of them may actually be transferring pure metals. But in every other case, it's a, a glutathione metal chelated molecule or um, phytochelatins, which are uh, um, uh, four amino acid repeats that also chelate metals. So, so there, is a, there is an amino acid or peptide in the story along the way with a couple of exceptions. So, so I think that the common theme is, so if it, er, if it evolved very early on in eukaryotes as a feeding mechanism for there's peptides in my environment, I should eat them. I think over time it probably diverged to, you know, um, peptides in certain configurations can bind to metals and I can use that to move it in planta. I think that would be worth doing. I, th I think, for those of you who didn't hear the question, would it be worthwhile going back to yeast and asking the question if yeast can also transport those uh, metal chelates? And I think, I think the answer is yes. Interesting enough, nicotiamine, um, there's only one company that makes it in the world. It's made in Japan, and it's actually used in cosmetics. Who would have thought? Great. Thank you, Mark.